humans really are obligatorily required to do aerobic exercise in order to stay healthy. And I think that has deep roots in our evolutionary history. If there's any magic bullet to make human beings healthy, it's to run. That's a quote from Dan Lieberman, uh, evolutionary biologist, anthropologist, paleoanthropologist, who wrote the story of the human body, a really powerful book. I've been thinking a lot about this question of what is the human body adapted for? Because when we have these mismatches in modern environments to the environments in which our body evolved, we obviously suffer a lot of pain, disease, dysfunction. So thinking about the, you know, the paleo era and the environments that we moved in, our ancestors moved in, in the past, and thinking about why our body took the shape that it did. What sort of types of movement is the human body especially gifted at or conducive to? Now, Ido, Ido Portal has made the point that we as humans are arguably the most complex movers on the planet. That is our specialty. That we are highly adaptable and and very good at picking up new skills and moving in incredibly complex, variable ways. Um, just look at the world of sports and look how the constraints of different tools or rules creates a whole uh, entirely distinct field and repertoire of movements in each different sport. You can also see this with any type of fishing or hunting or these activities where the tool, the bow or the fishing rod leads to a specific type of way of moving through the world and trying to acquire food and energy. The way that you fish with a fly rod is completely different that, than the way you might fish with a spinning reel. A spinning rod and we as humans can easily adapt to those tools to the constraints and then apply them towards our unique goals so there's a very strong argument there that that is our most unique feature as movers if we're just looking at the human body and looking for clues about its about how the shape of the human body and its physiology might give us clues about how we moved in the past in our daily lifestyle and what movements our bodies were trying to optimize and how those helped us to optimize survival in our landscapes. Then Dan Lieberman in his book, the story of the human body makes a very good argument that it is walking and running that shaped the human body to be this strange, bipedal, flightless, tailless creature that we are. Now, that may seem fairly obvious, but let's given that we are bipeds and we walk around every day. That's our fundamental movement. But let's think about why the ability to walk and run is actually beneficial to us. Because if we look at it, walking and running are actually made a lot more... Um, walking and running are improved by having four limbs on the ground. The fastest animal in the world, the cheetah, what does it have? Four limbs. It's got more ability to contact the earth, push off, and it's got more stability. So we aren't 
bipeds because it makes us especially fast runners or fast walkers. The reason we've become, one reason why we believe we've become bipeds is because it makes us, it would have made us especially efficient walkers and runners in the environments in which we evolved in these emerging grasslands. So one idea here is that as the as our ancestors were sort of, you know, <laughs> quote a quote coming out of the trees, moving out of these disappearing rainforests and into more um grassland, savanna type habitats, they were encountering less plentiful food sources. They had to go farther distances in order to get the nutrition that they needed. They filled this niche of being able to access uh, these scarce foods, these different types of foods, like these sort of fallback foods of roots and tubers and these things that uh, other apes would not have preferred. Most apes just want to eat the fruit that's right around them and they don't want to have to go far to get it. But we may, our ancestors may have filled this niche during a time of scarcity. They may have filled this fitch, this niche of being able to walk further distances uh, and go get these harder to reach food sources. They might have been especially good at, you know, reaching up and picking hanging fruit or something like that as well. So um, we then may have built upon this as our niche and try to optimize the efficiency of walking. So once we started down the path of walking and using that as our advantage during these lean times, it's also possible that we then laid the groundwork to go down the road of hunting and gathering in further lean times, you know, due to climatic change and cooling periods, ice ages and things like that, the strategy of hunting and gathering could have become um, super important for us. And this strategy of going farther distances to acquire both meat and food may have played a huge role in shaping us. But it's also very unique to us as humans because, again, a, other apes like chimps are not going to be walking or locomoting very far. They may only go two miles in a day in order to get all the food that they need. Whereas, you know, modern hunter-gatherers to get food, they may be walking six miles a day in order to forage or hunt. Further... Our adaptations to walking efficiently may then have played into running very efficiently and our ability to run very efficiently in the heat might have been our biggest advantage in hunting. So Dan Lieberman outlines this idea of persistence hunting, which is still practiced by some people around the world today, although it's obviously not quite as powerful as hunting with you know a bow and arrow or more modern weapons the idea being that a human can hunt an animal through endurance so the idea would be to spook an animal in the heat of the day to get that animal to run away to track it with your buddies track down the animals, maybe spook it again before it's had time to reset and cool down and continue this process of tracking and keeping the animal moving during the heat. Eventually, you get to a point where the animal is tired and tired enough that if you spook it one more time, you can keep up with it because it's moving at a pace that's not too high. At that point, these people would be running. They would be trying to catch up with this animal 
they'd be running at you know an endurance speed and constantly following the trajectory of this animal persisting and persisting until that animal basically collapses of heat exhaustion so essentially the this tricky way of you know putting an animal down doesn't really use any weapon or anything of that nature it's the only weapon here is the endurance and the persistence of the humans and the heat of the day now obviously the only way this is possible is if humans are especially good at endurance and especially good at throwing off heat you know we need the advantage of being efficient and easy to cool so why would the why would a bipedal shape be really good during the heat of the day better than a quadrupedal shape the bipedal shape means we have a less surface area facing the sun whereas the quadruped would have its whole back exposed to the sun we've only basically got the top of our head and our shoulders which might offer some reasons why we have pretty much no you know fur hair on the rest of our bodies we've only got it on the top of the head to help uh, protect us from the sun now you can go down this rabbit hole and other people have argued there's other reasons for these adaptations like the aquatic ape theory and things like that but i think it's a pretty strong case especially when you include uh, the idea that this lack of fur on the rest of our body also helps us to sweat helps us to cool really rapidly which furry animals can't really do they don't have the air contacting the skin and allowing them to cool another huge uh, advantage for us is our our breathing and our external nose the shape of our nose allows the air to spend more time swirling around in our nose which allows it to be humidified and cooled and make it um, you know, more <laughs> palatable, palatable for our lungs. It, it enters at a better temperature and exits. Um, and this is very important because the quadrupeds that we would have been chasing cannot cool by sweating. They can only cool by panting. But because of quadruped physiology, they can only cool they can only pant when they are at a trot not at a gallop so with persistence when we move these animals into galloping speeds instead of trotting speeds we thereby remove their ability to pant so we've effectively taken away their cooling method and then we just essentially run them into the ground by overheating them So, um, obviously, this idea of keeping the body cool is one reason why we might have taken this upright stance and had these, you know, big external noses and this lack of fur. We can also see quite a lot of adaptations throughout the body that lend ourselves particularly well to making running and walking especially efficient for us we've got the arches in the feet which act like springs which really help with the spring-like nature of running at endurance speeds we've got these extra thick and long achilles tendons which in chimps and other apes are super short i believe they're only about like a quarter of an inch and we've got like a four inch super thick achilles tendon which stores a huge amount of mechanical energy in running we've got you know thicker bone shafts in our legs which can help with the increased forces that come from being a biped rather than a quadruped we got knees that go closer to the midline to keep us from swaying swaying too much and our 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 uh hips uh, face laterally to give us the ability to connect the muscles on the side of our legs to help stabilize on one foot so we've got all these 
adaptations, these things that help us to move super efficiently as as bipeds. The upshot of all this, I think, is that it tells us that our bread and butter movement as humans is walking and running. You know, as I mentioned before, a lot of hunter gatherers, um, even, you know, modern hunter gatherers, they're they could be walking five to six miles a day. Um, and I think that knowing that our physiology, our anatomy has been set up to optimize for those movements, I think it makes a lot of sense that in order to maintain the quality of our anatomy and physiology, we need to be engaging in those movements. So walking regularly is, a you know, one of the most basic things and it's not the most exciting thing but i think it's profoundly beneficial for our mobility and our sanity really and running too Uh, i mentioned the quote by dan earlier about um establishing aerobic exercise and i think it's important to recognize that we are we are runners but we are endurance runners more than we are sprinters obviously sprinting is an important survival uh, activity as well but uh, more than anything we are long distance endurance runners Um, this makes a lot of sense when you look at Mark Sisson's work and his whole primal blueprint and the Uh, movement protocols he kind of lays out for people that follow our our ancestry he might not suggest um you know running every single day or walking six miles a day but what he does suggest is developing this aerobic base this aerobic ability to burn fat and move at slower speeds and and to move well at lower heart rates is kind of the foundation for all sorts of good movement at higher intensities. So the bulk of what Mark suggests is is this um, is cardio, which is at this, which is under the anaerobic threshold. So under the the period the heartbeat in which you would start to enter the anaerobic state and start to burn glucose you want to be in this aerobic fat burning state and that requires a pretty low heartbeat so doing things like you know walking running at slow speeds bike riding at slow speeds doing um, tai chi or certain types of yoga although you can definitely push yourself into anaerobic phases during a good power yoga session so it depends how you're doing it but he really vouches for the base of your movement practice being in that zone and then building upon that several times a week higher intensity uh, either you know strength training or power lifting even certain types of interval training where you're going all out for a little while resting going all out resting that could be in the form of you know using weights or doing a sprint workout or something like that but keeping those sessions very infrequent you know only a couple handful of times a week and keeping them short in duration um, so that we have the ability to go to those extremes but that's not our bread and butter that's not what we're doing every single day and if you look you know physiologically you know mark's making the point that when we tap into those extreme states too often we can elevate our cortisol levels to a level to a place where we are no longer gaining the full effect and we are also starting to accumulate the downsides of having elevated cortisol you know compromised immune function raised and as a result of that raised inflammation low testosterone or sex hormones uh, low energy levels as a result Um, many problems can arise from having yourself in this state of fight or flight elevated cortisol for too long 
And this can come from just being just outside the aerobic zone for too long. So being at an elevated heart rate, even doing cardio for extended periods of time can also put you at risk of developing, you know, an overproduction of cortisol for too long. So this is, you know, a huge point that Mark is making is that we need to have more staple slow movement throughout our day that nourishes us our you know keeps our heart moving and keeps our joints moving mobilizes us and we need to do less of the prolonged stress we need to be more fine-tuned and more powerful in our you know explosive movement our full-out workouts we need to be dialed in when we do those but we need to not drag them out and do them every single day of the week and i think this goes really well with um, dan's points about what we are adapted for as movers to be um, walking most of the day to be bending down foraging for berries to be working with our hands you know these are these are mobility tools really Um, and then you know occasionally having to lift heavy to you know build a shelter to to carry a fallen animal that you've taken down to occasionally sprint and run away from danger or whatever it was um you know we were stressing the body in these intense ways but it wasn't all the time and it wasn't for a super prolonged period of time so i think the upshot of this all is just spend more time moving your feet walking in nature if you can get on a trail run maybe take the shoes off and just keep exercising your your humanity because running is a huge part of it and walking is a huge part of it and it feels damn good Alrighty, thank you all for tuning in